Hi everybody, welcome to Bill Woodle Live for Tuesday, the 7th of uh, March 2017. Uh, disturbing, very disturbing reports today uh, that um, WikiLeaks has released a lot more information than was released with the Snowden leak. And included in that leak are a bunch of uh, really disturbing things and the fact that it's leaked is disturbing. So we're going to start off today with the entire idea of whether or not our U.S. intelligence services are coming unglued because this is happening every day pretty much now. And then in the second half for members we're going to talk about some of the Obama landmines that this dear, dear, honest, sweet, dignified man has left President Trump and the rest of the country to deal with. This is Bill Woodle live for Tuesday. Push the button, Neil. Okay, I can't be the only person in the country who's wondering, you know, what the hell is going on here? I mean, what's going on? We're getting we're getting leaks every day coming from inside the government that are targeting uh, Trump people. Before the election, we saw leaks from, uh, was it rogue CIA, WikiLeaks, uh, all kinds of other people. We, 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 it's starting to look like a sieve, for God's sake. Is there any information at all that we can keep um, confidential in this country? I'm, I'm beginning to really wonder about it. Uh, here's what I heard today. Um, WikiLeaks announced today that it'd be the seventh, yes, the seventh, that uh, they have released an uh, incredible number of documents, six, 7,000 documents, more documents than were released when Snowden went and, and basically took his little thumbnail, uh, his thumb drive out of the building. And now we're finding out all kinds of things, and all of them are disturbing. But most disturbing of all, by far, is the fact that these guys, like WikiLeaks, are able to read U.S. Um, most sensitive U.S. information uh, available. So before we get into the into the muck, on all, you know what? I'll do the muck first, and then I'll then I'll come back to the to the kind of the overpoint. So how bad is this, and what what kind of things are we talking about? Well, um, first of all, you'll be happy to know uh, that the CIA has. Look, this isn't news to me. It's probably not news to you too. But they have actually developed ways for things like your Samsung smart TV. I have one, two of them in this room right now. Three, sorry, three. Um, they found a way for that uh, when you turn it off. It's not really off. The little light goes off, but it's still recording your voice. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was recording video on things like your laptop and desktop and all the rest of it uh, without your knowledge, needless to say. Now, that brings up all kinds of issues. And the fundamental one is, which is the bigger threat to our republic and our freedom? Is it the uh, threat of terrorists or is it the threat of becoming the kind of country where you feel like no matter what you say, you're going to be recorded and it's all going to be written down and used against you someday. I'm going to go with B on that one. Um, secondly, uh, we find out some other interesting technologies that these guys are, are doing, and we shouldn't be finding out about these things. But for example, um, smart cars, or rather self-driving cars. They have um, undoubtedly, it says here in, in one of the WikiLeaks thing that they're developing or have developed the kind of software that could basically make a self-driving car just kind of go off the road. It doesn't seem so hard to believe to me. I mean, it seems like it'd be a relatively simple thing to do. Uh, so uh, WikiLeaks says that that's a pretty good way to assassinate people because a car accident's a car accident. The Soviet Union had a bunch of car accidents. Uh, key people were in car accidents in the Soviet Union, but those were just horribly messy that, you know, just nobody believed it. But, yeah, your car just swerves off the road, or maybe one another car swerves into you, whatever. Listen, I, I said this yesterday. I'll say it again today. I, have, I live in fear of, um, of paranoia. I just, it, it's the one thing I'm, I'm paranoid about. I just do not want to go into this netherworld where, um, you know, where, where people are inventing all these things. But just like yesterday, we have some actual data. You know, yesterday we talked about Obama staying in Washington, Valerie Jarrett moving into the House, Eric Holder saying he's coming roaring back and so on. That's actual data. And here we've got actual data too. Um, and the, the, the biggest point is we shouldn't be reading about this on the Drudge Report. You know, I shouldn't have this information, frankly. Now, the question is, should I have it or should I not have it? Well, it depends on what the information is doing. I'm very happy that the CIA is able to do these things because I believe fundamentally when you get down to brass tacks, 
The job of the CIA and most of the agents in the CIA and administrators are here to protect us against foreign threats, and in order to do that, this is what they need to do. I'm okay with that. What I'm not okay with is whether or not they are spying on the American people without um, without probable cause and, and, an, uh, and a warrant and all of those Fourth Amendment protections. I'm very worried about this. I'm worried that nobody knows where the line is. And I'm worried that if you've got a line that's very blurry like this, eh, should, we, should, we, should we listen to this call or no? I'm worried that they're on the side of the let's just go ahead and listen thing. The big picture here is that the intelligence services of the United States seem to me as a big supporter of the intelligence services of the United States, as a big supporter of them as a general rule, they look like they are just bleeding out. I mean, it is absolutely unbelievable how little confidence um, I have left in the ability for um, FBI, CS, uh, CIA, or NSA to not, to not to gather information. I'm not worried about their ability to gather information. I think their ability to gather information is superb. What I'm worried about is to keep that information secret. How is it that a, that a blonde-haired guy in, uh, in, a, you know, in an embassy in South America someplace is able to do so much damage and read so much of the of the American government's mail. How is this possible? Uh, there, there's a couple reasons how it's possible. I'll talk about those in just a moment. But you know, it it it's it's just simply it's simply unbelievable that I'm reading I'm reading pages on the internet of actual CIA techniques. I've got the CIA uh, code names here. You know, I'm not I'm not breaking any security. Um, uh, you know, boundaries by reading this. This is all over. This is on the Dredge Report, for God's sakes. However, if somebody had given me this confidentially and somebody said this is what's going on, you wouldn't have heard a word about it, not for me anyway. Um, so they've got a program called um, Weeping Angel, and Weeping Angel is the business, I think, about activating your, your TVs and your cell phones and so on. But here's the one, here's the thing that I learned today from these leaks that is the most unbelievable thing of all. It looks like one of the things that have been stolen from these um, government servers is now hang on because it's going to take a little moment for it to sink in and hopefully i'll explain it well enough in order to hack into computer systems you need a very sophisticated set of programs in other words the the program the, the computer that you're trying to get into has a series of safeguards and the simplest one that we use every day is what's your username and your password they're much 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 more complicated than that and Codes are so sophisticated now with mathematics that they're virtually unbreakable, so there's a lot of stuff going on. What we learned today from this big in, uh, in intelligence leak uh, from WikiLeaks is we learned this, that they have been using more code than Facebook. I mean, that's millions of lines of code in order to get these programs to be able to do what they want them to do in terms of surveillance. And it turns out, if this report is true, it turns out that one of the things that's been stolen from our government computers is the software that lets us basically break into any computer in the world. Do we understand that? One of the things that apparently, again, I'm just going to say it one more time, if this report is true and we're looking at documents that seem to support it that it's true, what that what has been stolen from uh, government computers is the actual attack software that is used to break into other servers. It's like it's like you have a master key in the hotel which opens up every single room in the hotel, and somebody stole the master key. Oy, almost about to say, I hate this feeling, and you do too. Um, who's in charge here? That's the first question, who's in charge here? Nobody seems to be in charge here. Um, one thing I've noticed since uh, the inauguration, and I think we're gonna see more and more of this as time goes on, is that no one, I think, well, maybe with one or two exceptions, maybe Madison and one or two others, but certainly the Republicans in Congress don't have the guts that Donald Trump has. They don't have the guts. We, I don't want to get off on the whole Obamacare repeal and replace thing, but you know, if you're a Republican and you vote to, um, to repeal Obamacare only when you're sure that you, it won't be repealed because Obama will overturn your vote, and now that it can be repealed, you don't vote for it. If you think that's going to save your seat, uh, you're wrong. I will. I will primary you if you if you're a Republican who was elected as far back as 2010 to stop this Obamacare thing. If you if you will not go with an actual repeal of Obamacare, then I will run against you. Um, but back to this whole thing because nobody's in charge here. Nobody seems to have the guts uh, that that Trump does. And and frankly, 
Why is James Comey still the director of the FBI? Can somebody explain that part to me, please? Look, he may be a good man. He may be a great man. He may be a guy who's been an absolute loyal, uh, you know, uh, servant of the American people and did what he saw best and all of that, and that's fine. I suspect not, but let's just say that he is. Let's say that he is. He has no credibility anymore. None. None. So why is he the director of the FBI. And if all of these leaks and all of these intentional leaks from the part of Obama staffers and all this stuff is going on, how do you fix this? You're talking about the most, theoretically, the most secure organization in the world. How do you find out who's, who's, who's issuing these leaks because of politics? So here's the two points I want to make. The first point is this, is that it is not Donald Trump who has destroyed um, America's intelligence gathering uh, credibility and their and their assets because their assets are gone. I'm reading their assets here. Here are their assets. Here are the things that the CIA does in order to gain foreign intelligence. So I'm reading them right now. Um, so somebody's responsible for securing this information and it's not secure. And there was one other thing here that was actually, yeah, that's uh, right. So if I'm reading it, then how come, why am I reading it? I'm not supposed to be reading this. I'm not supposed to know this stuff. I'm not supposed to know this stuff, but I do because somebody has screwed up big time. And the person who's ultimately screwed up big time is the president of the United States, Barack Obama, former president Barack Obama, because if this stuff is so available to WikiLeaks, it's available to anybody. It, it, not just that WikiLeaks would make it available to anybody, they stole the software that allows you to break into any server in the world. It's like stealing the Facebook software. It's millions of codes, lines of code. Somebody is not keeping an eye on the door. Somebody's not watching the shop. So what do we do about it? Well, Barack Obama's the guy who did this. This wasn't this wasn't happening in 2008. And you know, we talk about things like the most obvious thing. We talk about things like Hillary Clinton having a a server in a bathroom someplace in in New York, um, and then and then finding what was it six hundred and fifty thousand emails on Anthony Weiner's laptop, and so so you've got this known sexual pervert with basically the entire correspondence of the U.S. government on his laptop in his home, and the person who's responsible for this is Barack Obama because Barack Obama was one of the people who constantly was writing to Hillary Clinton on an unsecure server. And everybody knows it, but nobody will say it. He was using an alias and they tried to firewall this Hillary Clinton email scandal. They tried to firewall it at Hillary so it didn't go up to Obama. But the second, the instant that the president of the United States sends an email to whatever it was, HRC, you know, uh, at, um, at uh, clintonfoundation.org, the second that the president sends an email to that address that has anything in it that is official government business, he's as guilty as the rest of them. He's as guilty of the rest of them, and he sets the example. Now, my father was a hotel manager, and he was a damn good hotel manager, and he used to go into hotels that were not doing well financially, and he would make them do well financially. And he didn't do it by cracking the whip, and he didn't do it by, you know, by squeezing the last pennies out of the place. He did it by making sure that the staff understood that the entire experience of a hotel is a personal experience, and if you are going to run a successful hotel, you have to make a, an environment that people want to come back to. And that's what he did. He started with the staff. And that's because, because leadership, the, the tone, the theme, the, the, the ethics of an organization, all of it comes from the top down. And this is, what, this is what's happened. People, if the president of the United States is going to have official conversations with the secretary of state of the United States on an unsecure server, what do you think that tells the overall community? What do you think it tells the overall intelligence community in terms of what they do? And, you know, one of the things that they were saying the most, and, and, I, and I, you know, this is a, a, another gift that Obama and Clinton have given us. It's never going to go away. When a number of people inside the intelligence community were saying, you have to prosecute Hillary Clinton, they were saying it because they said, if we don't, if she doesn't suffer any consequences for this, then how do we prosecute anything else? Some sailor takes a thumb drive or takes a selfie on board a submarine by accident. You know, it's just some kid just snaps a selfie. He's been briefed about this, but it's not an act of espionage. But he takes a, a picture from inside the sub um, 
and he's being court-martialed and he may face prison time, how are we going to prosecute a guy like that when the Secretary of State has committed these kind of security breaches? It's, it's unbelievable. Donald Trump should, fire, should have fired everybody in the leadership positions there, and he should have done what I suspect Mathis is doing, Mattis rather, is doing in the Defense Department. After eight years of the Defense Department being compromised by these policies, I suspect what Mattis is doing is Mattis is looking at the staff in the Pentagon, and he's trying to decide which one of these people are warfighters and warriors who want to see American uh, troops protected and victorious, and which one of them, which one of these generals and colonels and, and lieutenant colonels and all the rest, which one of these guys are political generals and are here to do whatever the White House tells him. I suspect he's going right into that and getting down to the heart of it, and the new director of, of uh, not just the new uh, Justice Department head uh, Sessions, but also director of, of National Intelligence. We, this, needs to, this needs to stop. It needs to stop, and Barack Obama is the guy who basically let all of this get this badly, just this badly done. Look, you get in a boat, right, and somebody's on a boat for eight years, and you get inside a boat, and if the boat is leaking and there's been no paint, and if it turns out that the things, you know, the engine's rusty and the and 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 all of the the rigging is rotten and all the rest of it, it's not the fault of the guy who just bought the boat. It's the fault of the guy that owned the boat. But with that said, there's so much work to do, and now I want to talk about the most important issue here. Um, in this intelligence uh, thing here, and that's simply this: it's an, it is a, it, it's a cliche. It's been mentioned so many times that we no longer hear it. You know, when somebody says something so often that we just don't hear it anymore, just goes right past us. Well, let me just kind of put an anchor down here for something that's been said all the time, and let's just explore this as we close this particular segment out. The, one of the all-time truisms about human history and about um, military history especially is this. Generals are always preparing to fight the last war. Oh, everybody's heard that. And it's like, the first time I heard it, I thought, that's really true. That's really absolutely true. Well, it is true. Which is why there are new wars. Let's take our country, for example. The last war, the one that we really, the last big one, was a result of an attack on Pearl Harbor by Japanese fleet carriers and, uh, and a very large Japanese Navy. And since December 7th, 1941, since that date, the U.S. Navy, despite its weakened um, presence now, has been absolutely the best fighting force on the oceans and, and, and had been and will be for the foreseeable future. Because the idea of a fleet of aircraft carriers coming to attack either the American shoreline or Pearl Harbor or anything else, the idea of that happening is inconceivable. And the reason it's inconceivable is because we're very good at what we do, we Americans, when we decide to get motivated about something. And so we basically have made sure that there is never going to be another Pearl Harbor because there was already a Pearl Harbor. And so we put billions of dollars in, into these carriers. And I'm glad they're there. Don't get me wrong. I'm very glad they're there. They're useful. But we're not going to be invaded by a fleet of aircraft carriers again. And we're not going to be, we're not going to be in, um, overrun by armor either. We're not going to have to look at the German Panzers or, or Soviet T-34s or T-60s or any other rest of it, T-72s, coming through the folding gaps. It's not going to happen that way. It's going to happen in a way that we don't expect. And when we say we don't expect it, we cannot get our heads out of the idea that when we say uh, the, the, the next conflict is going to come from a new place, we're thinking it's going to be a new kind of a sneak attack, right? I mean, like 9-11, for example. It's going, to be, it's going to be an attack. It's going to be a physical attack, but it's going to be a new kind, and we've got to figure it out. 9-11 was kind of right in the middle of these two um, extremes, in that 9-11 was, um, was a military-style attack, but it was also cloaked within the civilian infrastructure. It seems to me exceedingly clear that the next time that something really takes this country down to its knees. We've never been on our knees, but we've been knocked off our balance. Let me rephrase that, put it that way. The next time it happens, it's going to come from areas that we simply, the average American citizen is just stunned by. It's going to be this. It's going to be this. Folks, this is what I'm trying to say when I say we always prepared to fight the last battle. We don't have to worry about a Japanese fleet attack or a Russian fleet attack or a German fleet or, or a Chinese fleet. We don't have to worry about that. We're well, well defended against the, the threats of the last war. But if I'm holding documents that the CIA 
is supposed to be keeping in the deepest, darkest chambers of our nation's um, computer systems. If I'm reading these things and you are reading them too, then that is exactly the same thing as looking back in history and finding out that on December 6th, 1941, the fleet wasn't ready for the air defense. The fleet wasn't ready for, uh, for incoming aircraft. The fleet had just gotten some radar up. But they saw these big blips coming in on radar. That's probably B-17s coming in. Probably B-17s coming out. We're expecting a flight of B-17s. There's a, a Japanese mini-sub sunk in the harbor before the air attack. That's probably a fluke. It's it's an indication of how unprepared we were for World War II, especially in the Navy in, in the Pacific, that the Japanese were that successful. How did the Japanese ever get to these islands? How? How did they get to Pearl Harbor? Forget the damage they did. How did they even get there undetected? They got there undetected because we did not imagine that it was possible. We just simply could not imagine that it was possible. What we're seeing now is that same level, to me, it looks like the same level of unpreparedness and, and vulnerability. And this is a cyber warfare example of a, of a battleship sitting on the bottom of the floor, uh, on the bottom of the bay at Pearl Harbor. That's what this is. It's a warning. It's a warning. And I am not very happy about all this, and I suspect you're probably not either. Um, it's... Look, it's 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 catastrophic, and maybe it won't be cyber. Maybe it'll be something else. Who knows? But we don't seem to be too prepared for cyber attacks in this country. If our top secret, top top secret computer assets are compromised to the point where this guy and his and his group of personal hackers, without government resources behind them, can can steal from the CIA the software that the CIA uses to steal other information. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? It tells me that Donald Trump and, and, and all of us had better do something right quick. We better make this a priority right now because I feel like the guy who's running down the hill towards the naval base on Pearl, at Pearl Harbor on the morning of Sunday, December 7th, and I feel like I'm the guy running down the hill like, the Japanese are coming up. Oh, sure they are. No, there's entire fleets of them. There's just waves and waves, hundreds and hundreds of aircraft. Oh, Bill, please. You know? No. No, it's got to be done before it happens. Cyber attack, if you, took down the, if you took down the internet and the computer systems of the United States, we would instantly become, instantly become a, a, an agricultural country. We would, we would become America in 1850. If you did that, everything would go, everything. We wouldn't have anything. We wouldn't have the computers. You think, well, we'd still be able to run the cars and stuff. Maybe not, you know? I, look, I got a 2012 Camaro, and I love it. I can start it from afar. That's kind of cool. doesn't really do me much good because I live in a warm climate, but it's cool. Sometimes I'll walk out there and start my car from, you know, 20 feet away. Um, and those of you probably remember, old enough to remember starting a car in the morning, used to mean young, 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 while you're pumping the accelerator, young, 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 young. The reason that doesn't happen anymore is not because of better gasoline. It's because the timing on the on the motor is electronic now. This where the spark happens relative to the piston determines whether the engine's going to start easily or whether it's going to run smoothly. And now that we've got electronic ignition, it does both. It starts easily right on the on the downward stroke, and poof, and once it starts, it switches back. It's all done electronically, and that means if it's done electronically, somebody might be able to either compromise it, change it, or at least cook it. So. Look, I'm not trying to make you run around with your hair on fire, but, but the truth is, honestly, I'm trying to make you run around with your hair on fire because this is the kind of warnings that we've seen all throughout history where it's like, it, it, what, what were they thinking? What were they thinking on Sunday morning? Why? Why didn't they listen? Why didn't they see this? It's so obvious in hindsight. And these are the kind of signals that we're seeing now in hindsight that we should be paying very, very, very close attention to. Um, all right, we're going to close our uh, feed down uh, again. I can just go a little longer than I want to with this, but uh, that's uh, that's our intelligence community debacle. Um, those of you who are members now are going to get to stay on the line. Uh, if you're watching on Bill Whittle Live now, there's no interruption, and uh, the second part of the show will be archived at BillWhittle.com, and that happens for um, for members. And if you want to be a member, it's an awesome, awesome, awesome thing to do with your money. We just think it's the coolest thing ever. All right, we will see you tomorrow, Wednesday, um, for our Facebook friends in the morning, and then we'll do another part of the show for our members. So, uh, Neil, it's, now it's time to say goodbye to all our company. F-A-C-E-B-O-O-O-K. Goodbye.